All right, welcome everybody to LTUE 2021. Uh, I am Brandon Ho, the moderator for uh, Write What You Know, Unicorns and Dragons. Uh, I am super excited for this one because we've got a wonderful panel of people and I think it's gonna be a super fun topic. And so what I'm going to be trying to do is uh, keep this very uh, light, conversational, um, just let us kind of dig in and just talk about um, our writing process together. And then also for all of you audiences, um, all of you out there in the Digiverse that are watching right now, if you want to type your questions or comments in the chat, I am following that. And so um, I will be able to read through those and I will try to integrate them into our conversation. So uh, without further ado, let's take a minute or two and just let everybody introduce themselves. Um, on my screen, Alan Johnson's first, and then it moves to Blake Castleman, Melinda Stodgrass, and Tom Durham. And so I will let you let you all introduce yourselves. All right, great. Well, thank you, Brandon. Uh, my name's Alan Johnson. I work out of South Carolina. Um, I do mainly screenwriting, but I'm dipping my toe into other arenas as well. And I also do fight choreography. I do a lot of consulting for uh, for people regarding medieval and Renaissance martial arts and things like that in, a, in cor incorporation with their stories or screenplays or whatever that case may be. Awesome. Uh, my name is Blake Castleman. I am an independent film producer and screenwriter and comic book writer. And I, uh, I work out of uh, Salt Lake City. Great. Hi, um, I'm Melinda Snodgrass. I'm a screenwriter and a novelist, um, and I work out of Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, when I'm not in LA, but it's good to be home. But you've done a lot of stuff out there. She's done a lot of stuff all over the galaxy. I'm just so excited to be uh, to be here with you guys. Um, I am I'm Tom Durham. I'm a film producer, a television producer. And I, I also dabble in all kinds of other uh, science fiction, fantasy, and media creation. Nice. All right. So let's go ahead and kick this off. Um, write what you know. That is a phrase that I hear tossed around all the time. And the first initial response that I always get when I hear that is, okay, so I guess I'm writing a story that only has to do with 30 something year old males that are half Asian, half American. And, and that's, that's it because that's who I am. That's what I know. So that's, that's how it goes. Um, that's always my initial gut response. Um, but I want to just toss it out to, to you guys. Um, when, when you hear, write what you know, what is it that you, you think in terms of what that means? And and what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start with Alan and, and work down, and then I'll just shift it up as we go through. All right. Thanks, Brandon. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there there is some legitimacy to to writing to your own experiences because that's what makes your projects uniquely you. You know, you have to have your own voice and your own um, view on life and everything else. And that can only come from you. If you try and uh, put that voice through somebody else's lens, it's not going to feel authentic. That being said, kind of if you want to know about something, then know about it. You know, do your research, do what you can to to discover things, and then in the core in the course of those uh, that research and that study. If there are things that exist outside of your spectrum, that's where you get to have fun. That's where you get to put the different pieces and parts together and 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 bush things together and see what works and what doesn't. So, what I, if 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 there's something that you don't know, get to know it or get close to it and play with it. Just have fun. I think also, <clears throat> it's not what you know, but who you know, there's a lot of people, family, friends, people I've worked with, people I've gone to school with, people I've known through other avenues of my life that um, if I'm trying to develop a character or or create someone that's not me, um, I, I reach out to relationships I've had, people I've known. And I also, um, and, and if I need something beyond that, then that's where like Alan said, the research comes in. You can read about things. You can read about people's experiences. You can watch YouTube videos. There's a lot of resources out there where we can 
uh, reach far beyond just ourselves as far as creating and, and, and through the creative process. Uh, personally, I hate that phrase, and I hear it all the time from creative writing teachers, and I really wish they would stop, um, especially for people who really want to write science fiction. I think it's just ludicrous. But, you know, this is where I usually do my, you know, afternoon special little present PSA presentation, which is education is never wasted, um, and that everything you've studied and everything you've done in your life, you can incorporate into it. And so I think, you know, I was a lawyer, I was a ballerina, I ride dressage horses, I sang opera in Europe, you know, all of those things come into what I write. So whenever you're given an opportunity to do something new, run out and embrace it, because it's going to give you that much more meat to draw from and things to draw from for your own writing. So, um, you know, I think the phrase is stupid. <laughs> I think what you need to do is follow your passion and the things that interest you. Yeah, for me, I uh, I think maybe write what you know should be re, maybe rephrased as write what you've researched and write what you love. And uh, I mean, there are there are a lot of people who have wonderful storytelling skills, and there's a lot of people whose stories need to be told, but they're not storytellers. But they still need their stories to be told. And so, I mean, some of the greatest books and, and, and some of the greatest ideas out there were, were not told by the people who experienced them. They were told by people who who, who, who dove into those things, you know. Um, and uh, and so I, I, um, I, I think there are, there are some other levels to that. I mean, I mean, certainly, certainly I think a, a writer or a, a, a storyteller of whatever, whatever kind we happen to be, you know, um, we certainly have a voice that we're telling these stories from, you know, and so I think we have to know ourselves and I think we have to become super empathetic to other people's stories and all that kind of stuff. I think we have to know our genre and I think we have to know at least, you know, I mean, we can certainly break the rules whenever we want to, but, but uh, we have to know the structure of how, of how our, our particular medium functions. So there certainly is a lot of, a lot of knowing and, and all of us have read stuff or watched movies or TV shows or, or, or certain things where it's like, this person does not know what they're doing, you know, whether it's because they haven't done their research research, or, or whether it's because they, they don't understand the, the mechanics of that medium. Um, and so I think in that sense, that's, that, 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 that's definitely true. Um, but I, I unfortunately spend way too much time researching. I, I wish I could, I, I wish I could f get quicker at finishing things because I, I, I find myself researching forever and, and second guessing myself forever. Um, and, and, and there really does come a point where you're a storyteller and you have a story to tell. And, and, and there, there's a certain point where, where you have to just tell a story, you know? Um, and, uh, and so anyway, I, I think, I think it, it, it means a lot of things, but it sounds like we're all kind of reacting in, in a similar way to that. Well, yeah. And I think, um, I think I, I, I love the negative reaction about how dumb that statement is. Your panel's dumb, Brandon. What's that? Your panel's dumb. My panel is dumb. No, no, no. But honestly, that's right. It's right what you know, unicorns and dragons, right? Like it's tongue in cheek because it's yeah. like we would never have unicorns or dragons or spaceships like Star Trek or Star Wars or any of those kind of things if we just go by like this very obtuse idea of uh, writing what you know. And so I kind of want to just establish that and get that ground in. And then really actually dive into uh, the meat of like, what can we actually do um, to take the experiences of what we know in order to make something better? So for example, um, I am half Chinese, half American. My dad is was born in Taiwan, Taipei. And uh, something that I grew up with experiencing was, you know, different languages in, in the household. And uh, something that I picked up and noticed was that, like, I will have grandparents or relatives speaking in Chinese and others responding in English, and it just kind of flips, flops, and changes. And so, like, with that personal experience of mine, I could take something like that and say, if I'm doing a story, and we'll just go fantasy. So we've got, like, uh, elves, right? Uh, we'll go J.R. Tolkien with the amazing elven language. Uh, what would it mean if the, the, the elf uh, father-daughter are having a conversation and the daughter is always responding, speaking in English and her dad is only speaking Elvish, right? Like I can take my personal experience and find 
meaning and and nuance in that and then use it to inform the thing that I am creating. And so I want to propose to to all of you like what what methods do you use in order to inform and add a uh, substance to the the stories that you're creating? And this I'll just leave open. Someone can just go if they feel up to it. Well, I have to warn people in public, writers, I mean, we can't do it in COVID land, but writers, we are the most terrible eavesdroppers in the world. I don't know about anybody else, but if I'm in a cafe or I'm in a restaurant and there's some fascinating conversation going on at the table next to me, I'm sort of taking notes and going, ooh, I can use that. You know, that's marvelous. Um, So I think part of it is is observational skill. you know, I think writers have to, I, I know this sort of image is that we all sit alone and we do a lot, but, you know, you also need to sort of go out into the world and and just experience it and meet people. And, and even if you're not meeting them, spy on them and take what you can pick and, and use it to uh, deepen your work. And I think that's a very important part of this. Yes. One, one thing that I do is I, I might, cheat a little and where tom talks about he researches too much and where he's he's taking too much time with his research my problem is i don't research enough and so one thing that i do is is i i write what i know but i write what i don't know and the reason why i do that is because i have a writer's group we meet twice a month we read each other's scripts and we give feedbacks and this is probably terrible advice, but I just I just write things like I wrote a script where two people went into a bank to get to, to break into a safety deposit box. Well, there were certain little details in there that I just kind of like, well, maybe that it would work this way or maybe it worked that way. And lo and behold, one of the people in my screenwriting group actually worked in a bank. And so in the feedback process, he actually set me straight and right said, no, they right would know. Yeah, yeah, write what your friends know, write what people in your writer's group might know. But it was great because he was able to set me straight and say, no, it would work like this, and then the teller would do this, and then the manager would do this. And so I was able to take that information and in the next revision, make that scene more realistic. One of the things that I like to do with a lot of my projects and the projects I consult on in regards to especially fight scenes and and weapons and things like that, um, even when you're working in fantasy, there's, there occasionally needs to be that touch in reality. It needs to be grounded in something that's familiar or at least makes sense. I, in my younger years, I was very um, strict on being as historically accurate as possible. Um, because these are the people that actually use these weapons. These are actually how they existed in, in real life, and and therefore they would exist in, in other realms as well. Um, but I, over the years and more recently, I've changed that from being historically accurate to being martially honest. And what that means is that the when you're bending and breaking the rules of what exists in real reality, do it from a place of information as opposed opposed to a, from a place of ignorance. So if you're twisting or breaking the rules of how weapons work or how armor works, um, do it on purpose because you know what aspect you're changing and how that changes the rules and what that means for your characters. And so you're doing it from a place that's informed and makes sense in the context of your story and the, the world that you're writing in. Otherwise, you're just being ignorant and it may not matter. There may only be a small facet of your your audience that, that gets it or understands it or be able to call you out on it. But if you're going to do it, you may as well do it well and be as informed as possible. And even when you're creating things that are new or twisting rules or breaking them entirely, do it on purpose uh, so that it helps to inform your story and enhance it as opposed to just being a random choice that detracts from it. Yeah. Yeah. You guys may have heard of uh, Brandon Sanderson's, uh, you know, different rules of of writing, and his his zeroth rule. He's got first, second, third, whatever rules, and he has the zeroth rule, which is the rule that trumps all rules. Which is if it's awesome and you love it, do it, you know. And um, and you know, there, there's certainly something to that, and that involves knowing your audience. You know, I know I love this, and I know my audience loves this, so I'm just gonna do it because it's just awesome, you know. And um, 
And so I, I think we, we definitely need to allow ourselves the, you know, the, the freedom to, to do that. You know, in, in my case, um, one thing that I, I recently discovered was um, I, I have the great fortune of, of playing in, in a few different mediums in TV and film and, and books and, and I'm doing a, a radio series this year. And, um, and, and as I, as I kind of look at different stories and, and what medium to kind of place them in, I have to think, well, okay, what medium does this story work best in, which involves kind of knowing stuff? And then also, which one am I ready to write? Or which one am I ready to actually create? You know, and 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 I, I have a, a deep passion for for two of my stories. One is a one is this uh, this big YA fantasy story, and then I have a very hard sci-fi adult sci-fi story. And um, and and I realized I'm just not ready to write one of these. You know, my my soul, or for whatever reason, I, my my skills, or whatever whatever the situation is, I just know that I can't write this one, but I know that I can write this one. You know, and I know that I can I can just fly along and, and get it done, you know, and, and, and make it awesome. So so I, I guess for me, that, that's been my biggest discovery of of discovering what, you know, or I, I should say writing from what, you know, the other thing I, I would just caution all, all the, the new creators out there. I, I think uh, we're, we're on the media track and there's a lot of probably indie film type people out there that are listening to this or people want to get into movies or, or whatever. Um one thing that a lot of young people or people I just start starting out in this industry don't understand is that they feel like they're only successful or they're only cool if the first thing they do makes money. And, um, and so they end up spending a lot of time doing nothing because they, or, or I should say being frustrated. You know, I, I don't mean to insult anybody cause I, I've been in, I've, I've made all the mistakes that you could probably make in it. And, um, I and, think we've all made our first terrible film somewhere around there. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. And, um, and um, so I was going to say, I'm I'm the uncoolest person on the planet. If that's if. <laughs> okay, but well, hey, well, and, and you get it. You 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 you've been around, but it's okay to spend money and waste money on on your creative projects. So if you need to just pay someone to tell you what to do, one of my stories has as a character. It's very important to me that they speak in Scottish dialect. And it would take me a year to master that. It would take me a year of dramaturgy or whatever you call it to master how to write that. And after I write the story, I'm going to pay a Scottish person, a Scottish linguist, to rewrite that dialogue. And it's going to cost me a bunch of money, but it's going to save me months of time. Yeah. And I'd also add that the money is never wasted if you go in specifically to learn and you know the reason why you're you're using that money without the the gain of the money um at the end of the project um somebody actually brought up an interesting oh go go for it melinda no i was i was going to go back to this uh idea of when you break the rules uh yeah which you know you have to do because you know the plot requires it and we have this wonderful trick in screenwriting which is called hanging a lantern on it and so rather than let your audience go wait a minute you know they never used you know, hangers in the British Navy that way, you go ahead and have some character say that or say that to some effect that enables you to go, yes, I know that. Here is why I'm doing it. And and please don't write and yell at me, you know. Um, and so we have all these fun little tricks like, you know, don't be too on the nose, hang a lantern on it. Um, and that's a way for us to get around doing these kind of stories that we want to tell. But, you know, reality intrudes. And at some point you have to go, I mean, my, my friends who do the uh, Expanse books, somebody said, well, how do the engines work on, on these ships in the Expanse? And Daniel looked at them and said, they're made of plot. And I went, perfect. Yeah, they're made of plot. And that's kind of what you just have to occasionally embrace that. that and because it it ultimately isn't about the little plot, plotty moments in a movie. What keeps people watching, especially in television, but in movies as well, do I care about these people? Am I passionately invested in them? And if you fail that, I don't. it doesn't matter how great your plot is and how intricate it is, because if, they, if the people aren't engaging, it's not going to work. Yeah, there's a film lore story about a director of photography that's lighting a night scene and he's shooting all of these huge lights out into the forest and the trees and everything. And the director comes in and says, you know, what, it's nighttime. Like, where are all these lights coming from? And the director of photography responds, the same place as the music. 
And so, you know, when you're when you're doing your stories and stuff, you do have a little bit of leeway when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, what's important is, you know, that you're entertaining and engaging the audience uh, with what it is that you have to say. Um, someone did bring up a question that I thought was interesting and want to know what you all think. Um, he wanted to know if the process of using personal experience is different in screenwriting versus other forms of writing. In personal experience uh, integrated into the action or the, the what the characters are doing or yeah, I would say all of the uh, yeah. experiencing. I I think it's the same storytelling as storytelling. And the only difference is with screenwriting as compared to a novel is your it's it's a visual uh, piece of storytelling, and so you're you're not getting inside the characters. Uh, you're not you're not you're not inside the character's head, experiencing their internal conflict firsthand. It's all externally. The internal conflict is being portrayed externally. Right. I I would say. Um really the biggest difference between those two for me would just be that if you're writing a novel for example and you're pulling from your experiences that's kind of all they're going to get once that novel's done if you're doing a screenplay uh you're gonna have directors actors production designers wardrobe and everybody coming in and creating that product and so everybody actually comes in and brings their personal experiences to the table so there's more of a likelihood of, of all of their individual elements um, adding that kind of uh, flavor to the overall product of the film. And there's also the, the caveat that our lives are rarely as interesting as we think they are. And if we get too slavishly tied to um, doing things exactly the way that we perceive them, it will most likely make a very horrible, very boring screenplay because our lives are not structured in a cinematic fashion. Um, it just does not work very well. Biopics are notoriously very hard to do unless they are isolated on a particular event uh, in a person's life. There are obviously exceptions for everything, but but generally speaking, the person has to be extremely dynamic, extremely popular, or it's focused on a very specific event in their life, um, one particular point in time with a very specific goal. Um, but generally speaking, our lives are, are, are just not good cinematic material unless we can just mine pieces and events and choices and then create things around that. Well, right. I actually play Star Trek soundtrack music during my day, and so my life does feel quite cinematic <laughs> as I go through my day. And, and I'm going to mention a homework assignment for anybody watching. I mean, biopics, yes, I, they are really difficult, but there was a great one a few years ago um, about uh, Marshall, uh, who became ultimately a justice on the Supreme Court, and it took an event from earlier in his life, and it's a brilliant film. Um, and it's this one small incident from his life when he was still working for the NAACP, and it's a terrific film. And it kind of shows you how to do that well, because he isn't the major focus. He is being seen through the eyes of another character. And that's another really powerful way to remark on a person is to not be, you know, not be playing with that person, but how does that person affect the world around them? Yeah, I think that's. Go for and, it. And, and well, and and just a, another a, another technique to think about whether you're writing a book or a screenplay or a, or a radio drama or or whatever you're doing is is I, I think it's an absolutely essential tool to ask yourself what would I do if this dragon popped out of the pile of gold? Like what what would I actually do? You know, and then and you can take that to different levels. What would I do if I was braver than I am? What would I do if I was more charitable than I am? What would I hope I would do? And and so and 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 right there, the answers to those questions, you've just built your plot arc right there. I mean that that, that is a very quick exercise that immediately tells you if if it, it, it you know it immediately informs what your main character might actually go through to have this wonderful story. You know what would I do if my best friend was suddenly confronted with the most evil magical talisman in the universe. And I was just his gardener, but I loved him dearly. What would I do? Okay. Who's that? Okay. And then what would I do 
if I am on the verge of, I'm, I'm on at, at the end, at literally the world's end, where there's fire all around me and such and such. So I'm talking about Samwise, and you see, you know, Samwise is going to do something very different at the end than he would at, at the very beginning, um, something that would that would greatly surprise him. And so, so there, there's there, there's a huge power in asking and just a couple basic questions, and that's going to apply to every every medium in the universe that you're going to write for. Yeah, and I think an, another way to approach that would just be along the lines of looking at something that you wouldn't do and say, well, what scenario could play out where I would act like that and how would I be able to justify that or, or do that um, to try to kind of step outside of yourself a little bit to understand other people's scenarios or circumstances um, to, to get a little bit more of that empathy so that you can apply them to characters and that you normally wouldn't um think of as, as people that would be doing those kind of things. Um, well, one question that I do have is that um, it was mentioned that our lives aren't interesting and, and everything like that, but we are kind of our own barometers in terms of, I'm, I can say that that's good because I like it. Um, to, to say that other people like that, I think is always a guessing game. Um, so as I have done uh, different films and shorts and stories and things like that, I found different things that I do um, to try to make sure that it is engaging uh, to them. Uh, what things, what techniques or, or uh, rules do you set for yourself uh, as, as you write your stories to, to help identify that what you think is good is actually good? Well, Tom mentioned know the genre, and I think that's a good place to start because Genres have conventions that absolutely need to be part of what you're creating. Genres have to have, but you want to avoid cliches. Um, there's tropes that absolutely need to be part of that genre, but you want to avoid tired old tropes. And that's where I think a lot of your understanding the genre, going to websites that, that talk about tropes and uh, reading. I mean, yeah, screenwriting maybe starts with watching movies, but I, I, I'm a real proponent of people reading um, to, to, as, as a number one source of help for their writing. And there's a lot of things you can learn out there. And, uh, you know, and, and, and again, going back to feedback from others, yeah, people can point out stuff that you put in that's cliched, but but uh, the, the more you know about the genre, the more you can avoid putting in stuff that, that is not going to engage your, your first audience, which will be your readers. Yeah, and I, in addition to having other people read, beta readers to read my work, whether it's a novel or a screenplay, if it's a screenplay, um, I try to gather together people who are actually fairly talented at acting, um, and I sit with a notepad and I let them read the script. And I just listen um, because things that you thought were just brilliant when you hear them being said, you're like, oh, never do that. <laughs> oh, don't do that again. Um, and it's really, really helpful. Um, it's also humbling. And you've got to you've got to be ready to, you know, lay your baby out there and have somebody read it. And everybody sort of go, "Ooh," you know, and then you go, oh, yeah, fix that line. Um, and that's also very, very helpful. Yeah, and Melinda, something that I try to always practice when doing the the feedback is I don't try to explain anything, but I just sit there with the pen and I, I ask them to basically tell me everything. And it's so hard because you want to say, no, you didn't get that because, but you have to understand that you're not going to be there to explain it to everybody who sees the thing. And so that's when you actually have to sit down and say, okay, why didn't they get that? And how can I make that more clear? Um, Alan, is there something you, you'd like to, to add? Um, yeah, I mean, I think kind of we've touched around it uh, a couple times here, and especially in regards to genre and stuff like that. I think it's also very important for for newer writers in the in the blitz to try and get noticed to not chase the market. Um, because if you are trying to chase the market, you're already about two to three years too late. Uh, by the time you get your script, you get it written, get it polished, get it out there, try to get somebody notice, and then per go through the meat grinder of production. You're, the, the, the market that you're chasing is gone; it's changed. So that's the the important thing with it is, is to if you're really wanting to say write a horror movie, you know, 
moviegoers and television viewers are so savvy right now because we are just consuming uh, media at an unprecedented you know rate right now people have seen so many movies and so many tv shows if they're a fan of a genre if they're a horror fan they're going to know if you're not being honest to that genre they're going to be able to sniff you out if you're a fraud and you're just trying to get a money grab because horror is hot right now you know or whatever the case may be um they're going to figure that out real quick and uh, hopefully that won't be a you know a multi million dollar mistake for you and the production crew that backs you or whatever. Um, but I think that's really important is is in the cor- in the course of um, creating a new project. If you're if going into the idea of yes, this needs to be something that's you know geared for the market, but also it's got to be something that you're passionate about and willing to live in this space for a while because the the market may pass you by, but you still have to be invested in it to finish the project or whatever. So. Don't chase the market, and if you're going to do something in genre, make sure that you really love it and you're really doing it for the right reasons and not because it seems like it's an easy cash grab. Yeah, because last thing you want to do is be really successful in that cash grab and then be stuck in something you hate. If you really want to know what the market is looking for, there's there's the script pipeline, there's ISA, there's the kind of like the Netflix uh, Imagine Impact stuff. There. They're the ones saying this is what we're looking for right now in, in terms of scripts, not what's coming out and what's popular right now. And so there are places you can go. I pitched a just a, in January. I pitched an action comedy to through the Impact Imagine Impact uh, website because that's what Netflix is looking for. Yeah. Um, earlier, Tom mentioned getting a, a Scottish language expert uh, to go over a script. I'm curious, uh, how do you all identify when you need an expert to double check the thing that you're doing? And when you get to that point, how do you find those experts? Uh, well, I, um, for me, um, when I, this is going to sound silly, but when I, um, when I'm writing uh, my Scottish character, I'll be like, ah, this, I need a word here. There's, this, it just isn't sounding authentic for some reason. And, and so then I'll, I'll go on YouTube. And I'll find the the Scottish YouTubers who actually do their languages. And I've actually identified a few that I'm going to hire. And so w- when I'm done with my book, the ones that I like, the ones that seem knowledgeable and very, very native and just seem like they're fun to work with, I'm just going to reach out to their to their business contact on YouTube. And I suspect that they're going to have a rate for exactly that thing. And uh, and then also through academics, I you know, I, I'm working on a, a web series right now where we have, a, you know, we have. Um, an academic consultant, you know, and it's just, it's just a PhD who is an expert in the thing that we're producing, you know, and, and so, um, so just, you know, you ask a few people and pretty soon you're going to come up with, you're going to, you're going to find an expert that you need. And again, my, my, my litmus test is just, is this flowing? Like as I'm writing, is this flowing in a way that I, I feel like I know what I'm talking about? And, uh, and if, if it isn't, then either I need to do a little more research or I need some help. So. Um, I often reach out to the people who are experts in my life. Um, one of the novels I was writing, a uh, big space opera thing, I wanted um, I wanted the emperor to wreck a, a royal governor financially. Um, and so I called my stockbroker and I said, here's the setup. Tell me how to destroy this guy uh, financially. And so we spent a lovely hour talking about all the ways you can screw over somebody um, with with finances and with you know flooding the market or holding back or you know all of these things. It was it was really fun. It was really useful. Um, and and I do feel like that's one of the things that especially in our genre we do tend to overlook. We we tend to forget about law and we tend to forget about economics in science fiction. Um, and it's one of the things that makes me crazy <laughs> because. Um, they're fundamental, you know, to how societies work. And so I think all those things need to at least be in the back of your mind. You don't have to give somebody a lecture from the World Bank, but at least, you know, show that there's a way in which this society functions. Yeah, so something that I have learned is that everyone has a story. And so it's just amazing what you pick up and learn from people that are around you if you just start asking um 
you know, I can just think in terms of just my little neighborhood. I found people who were Falcon trainers, who were uh, like gemstone collectors, who were taking rocks and tumbling them and, and turning jewelry into them. Uh, farmers, people who have gone through wars, like so many different things. Like everybody has a story. And if you take an interest and just talk to people and learn about them, it's amazing, like all the little uh, uh, engaging, interesting things that you can find just splintering off of just the individuals around you. And so um, to jump into another section on this, um, how how do you when you when you jump in and, and kind of write uh, your characters, uh, how do you uh, make them interesting or engaging or or make them stand out from all the other characters that you're writing? Uh, what is it that you do? What techniques do you have that, that make them feel like their own individual people rather than all just small offshoots of, of your own selves? I read my dialogue aloud. And if it all sounds the same, I go back and rewrite it. Um, I mean, I don't tend to go into dialect because I think that can be awkward, but it's just, um, I was a musician, so I look for how, how dialogue rhythms, you know, is there a particular rhythm that a person uses in their speech pattern? Um, you know, it, but I try to find things, but yeah, I mean, when I was on Reasonable Doubts, if you walk down the hall past all of the writer's rooms, you would hear all of us muttering aloud as we read our dialogue aloud, you know, all these different, you know, voices as we tried to say, does this really sound like, you know, um, uh, God, I'm just, I can remember the character's name, Dickie, you know, or does it sound like, you know, Marley when she is going to speak? Um, and so, you know, I think that's really important to read your, always read your dialogue aloud. Yeah. And a lot of that stuff can change uh, off of cultures and stuff too. I, uh, uh, just about the, the last film that I directed, um, we had this line of dialogue where these two characters were trying to figure out that missing thing for this location they were preparing for. And the answer was flowers. And so somebody mentioned um, Johnny's uh, because they were going to go to a Johnny's flower shop to get flowers and so he's sitting there, he's like, yeah, Johnny's. And they're like, oh, you're right, Johnny's Flowers. Let's go get those. And um, a little bit before filming, a little bit before filming, we found out that the main actress was really embarrassed about the scene because uh, a Johnny in uh, London or Europe is a condom. And so when, when she had to come out and say Johnny's, it meant something completely different <laughs> for her. And so uh, a lot of times saying things out loud is really good. And a lot of times you can find uh, richness by looking into the different cultures and see uh, the slang or the vernacular or the things that they do in terms of, of how they express themselves. <laughs> and you can use it to catch your own mistakes like uh, we ended up doing on our film. I think also one thing that uh, a less experienced author might or writer might do is is uh create the the passive character like if i put myself in this situation how would i react and that can kind of i don't know i'm guessing most people are like me that they're kind of a coward in, in life and and would avoid putting myself in uncomfortable or compromising situations but you have to remember that that you know we can give parts of ourselves to characters but we need to take these characters and have them do things or decide things or say things that we wouldn't say. And I think that really gives our characters distinctions apart from us, even though there can also be part. I mean, we, we, we know what it's like to be angry. We know what it's like to be sad. We know what it's like to be joyful. We know what it's like to be disappointed. We know what it's like to be discouraged or frustrated, you know, and, and we can draw on, our past experiences with all these different emotions to give them to our characters when they're in 
certain situations that might bring on these emotions. But at the same time, we really need to 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 be a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, be be a writer who wants to push our characters into places that we wouldn't want to go if we were in a real life situation. Yeah, you guys have heard of uh, J.K. Rowling's um, uh, Potter Room. So there's a room in her house that is just absolutely packed with Potter paraphernalia that inspires her as, as she kind of tours the room and handle, handles the objects. Um, and and I think that when we can physically see or touch or imagine some of our characters, it's going to help us to distinguish them in our writing. And so um, so one thing that I found really helpful is um, is an illustration of your character. Um, and so when, when you're writing from that person's point of view, um, you know, if you have in your head, great. And you had kind of a list. Okay. She looks kind of like my mom. She has a personality kind of like superwoman. She has, you know, you can have those kind of things that help you, but a physical illustration, even if you have to pay an illustrator is going to really help you to, to, to segregate your thoughts and to not cross pollinate all your characters. So, so that you're just using characters as plot points and exposition that way they they're, they're coming from a specific place and it just, it recruits a bunch of neurons in your brain if you actually have a picture of them. Just real quick, one of the things I like to do if I get really stuck on something is I'll go ahead and cast the movie on my own. I'll create my own little fantasy cast. And if I get stuck, I say, all right, well, what if we put Samuel Jackson in this, you know, in this role? How is he going to say these lines? And, and okay, well, maybe that's, maybe that's too many explicitives. How about Idris Elba? You know, how, how about we switch that up? And the, the music, like, you're, like uh, we were talking about earlier, the musicality, the, the way that people deliver lines and the way that they speak. And then, and then and then color that with their uh, their psychological makeup. What, what is their personality like? What was their upbringing like? And how does that affect the way that they interact with other people? I love that you picked out Samuel L. Jackson of all the actors. <laughs> Fantastic. My go-to is always Tom Hiddleston. It's like, yeah, anytime. Could Tom be in this movie? Could he be in this TV show? <laughs> <laughs> um all right there's one last question here uh there's a story i want to tell that i know my skill level isn't up to handling yet because when i try to write it it's not working how would you decide when to try it again yes do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Writing is rewriting. Yeah. Cliche. Yeah. yeah. Just keep on, yeah. keep on doing it, it until it massages it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would mean, say, oh, go, go for it, Melinda. I, I was just going to say, you know, every time I write something and I know it's not exactly right, I know I can fix it in post, you know, I mean, I'm going to rewrite yeah. it. Um, you, you, you cannot allow yourself to be frozen. I, I, you just, you know, just plunge in and do it. For one thing, you're going to get better through the doing of it. And then the next time you go back to it, I mean, I, I have a pilot, a TV pilot that I'm working with some folks on. And um, I set it aside for a few months and I went back three days ago and I did a polish on it again. Um, went, oh, yeah, that line of dialogue's terrible. Let's lose that. I mean, you're never frozen and you can always get better. So yes. don't, don't let fear stop. You. All right. Yes, I was going to say, do it wrong now so that you can do it right later. You're never, ever have, going to have a perfect first draft. No one is ever going to have a perfect first draft. And I actually love the rewriting process more than writing the first draft. Yeah. And, you know, coming coming back around full circle to this kind of write what you know thing, um, I'm a firm believer that we all have our own stories and we all have our experiences and we all have our personality quirks and everything like that. And so what we bring to the table, the stories that we tell is something that is inherently uniquely ours, right? And so like, don't, don't be afraid of write what you know. Don't let someone telling you write what you know. Uh, don't let them tell you that as a way to inhibit the things that you, that you want to, to say. Um, but instead allow that to be something that 
informs the work that you do, that gives flavor and character to it. Because at the end of the day, once you write that story and it's your story, it is your story and nobody can take that away from you. Um, we're at the end. Is there any last remarks or anything that you would like to, to add on to that? Just one final thing. I, I really enjoyed what you said there, that, you know, it's your story. Nobody can take that away until you sell it and it goes into production and then it goes into a meat grinder and then it comes out the back end. It doesn't resemble anything you wrote in the first place, but that is the plight of the screenwriter. One of the most difficult things about doing just writing and not producing or directing is being at peace with the story that you've written and then handing that over to somebody else and then have it be a completely different thing coming out the back end. But that'll be somebody else doing what they know, right? I always, I always uh, see a movie in my head when I write the script, even on rewrites. But I do that knowing that when it's made into an actual film, what's in my head is going to be mine and what's on the screen is going to be a, a collaboration of a lot of people. I want to say thank you guys so much for, for your time and for being here. Uh, thank you to the audience for tuning in and, and watching us from whatever direction that you may be. And, uh, you know, get out there, write what you know, write what you don't know, and uh, and learn. So thank you so much all for coming.